Welcome to the New Europe Studios, where you can watch us and make the news. Today I'm with Madibo Traore from the Food and Agriculture Association. He's been having a regional conference, he's based in Ethiopia, and he's here ahead of the EU Africa Summit to talk to us about food and food security in Africa. So, we've set ourselves this great goal of reducing hunger. How are we doing with that? Thank you very much, Andy, for uh, giving me this opportunity. <coughs> you are uh, right. Uh, I'm coming from uh, Tunis, where we had uh, the 32nd, uh, Afri uh, the 28th African Regional Conference mm -hmm. for Africa, which is a gathering where uh, the ministers of agriculture from the 54 African countries gather every two years with FAO, with other UN institutions uh, to take stock of what has been achieved during the last two years and also to agree on the plans for the future. And uh, this year, of course, was a very special year. As you know, this year is also the African Year of Agriculture and Food Security. This is a decision from the summit in January, the summit of African Union. Uh, it was decided that to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the CADEP, which is an African framework uh, to promote and to develop uh, agricultural uh, production in Africa to fight food insecurity. Uh, it has been decided that uh, 2014 will be uh, proclaimed as the year of African agriculture and food security. So that's why it is very important to understand this context. The context is that uh, the African leaders have now decided to do everything possible to eradicate hunger by 2025. This is very, very new because this is the first time the African leaders set a date, a deadline for them to achieve uh, such a goal. That's why uh, the meeting in uh, Tunis was focused on two main issues. Mm -hmm. How to support the effort of African countries yeah. in eradicating hunger by 2025, on one hand. On the second hand, how to take advantage of this effort to create new job opportunities for the youth in Africa. These were the two main issues on the agenda. Can, um, I, can I just say is one thing I've noticed from your, your description and your, your context that, that appears to be a change, and it appears to be a change that various other people we've spoken to about Africa and its future, is that the decisions now appear to be more being taken by Africans and African leaders Whereas before, these decisions were made in Washington, in Geneva, or wherever. Is, is there a sense of Africa is taking control of its own destiny? I think so. I think uh, that uh, uh, since the uh, launching of the NIPAD, which is a new partnership for African development, since uh, 2003, the African leaders uh, have come to the conclusion that uh, uh, the issue of food security in Africa should be their business, uh, not uh, to anyone, NGOs or international organizations, uh, to tell them what to do, how to do it, but they need the support of international organizations. And this is what FAO is doing. This is what FAO has been doing uh, since 2003 with the African leaders. They are the one to set the agenda, they are the one to set the goals, and we, with our technical uh, experience and knowledge as FAO, we support them in implementing the program they have decided for themselves. Okay. This is a big difference from the past. I'm very glad to see that you're, you're making the same observations that we're hearing from many others, so it does seem that there's been an absolute fundamental change in the way that we deal with Africa, that we, we look at the continent, we treat the people from the continent and its, and its issues. Now, 
central to this is, is re reducing hunger, mm -hmm. of course, and your other main point is about job creation. Mm -hmm. We've seen the importance of job creation. We've seen it being one of the main drivers behind the Arab Spring, of people just having no real hope. Could you just tell us exactly, because people don't really understand what exactly are the employment opportunities for young Africans. I mean, the unemployment rates must be... Yeah, of course, uh, employment is a, a big area. Yeah. And uh, what uh, we are talking about is in the area of agriculture yeah. and food security. Look, you know, agriculture is a continuum from production to uh, consumption. Uh, what happens now is that uh, the segment, the production segment, where most of people are being employed, these are small farmers, and you know that small farmers, are, uh, they represent uh, more than 80-85% of the total uh, population of farmers in Africa. This is where they are working, in the production segment. They are uh, uh, growing uh, different cereals, they are breeding livestock, uh, fisheries and so on. But in a way that is really very difficult and is not attractive for the young, young people. So what we want to do in this segment is to ensure that the production and productivity can be increased. And when you want to increase production and productivity, you have to use the modern uh, technologies, mm -hmm. the modern means, the inputs that uh, farmers need uh, to boost their production and productivity. So this is on one hand. On the other hand, upstream the production segment, mm -hmm. yeah. you have a lot of services to be deployed, to be developed in terms of supply of seeds mm -hmm. of good quality, adapted seeds, improved seeds to farmers. You have the, pro the different uh, inputs like uh, fertilizers, like uh, phytosanitary products, mm -hmm. also need to be deployed uh, to improve production and productivity. Of course, you need extensionists, the people who will be uh, dealing with farmers to train them, to explain them how to use this, uh, this technology, what are the uh, conditions of getting the most of a particular technology. So this also is a, a very important part where you can create a lot of job opportunities. Up to now, I think these opportunities were not really uh, explored and uh, that's why we think that uh, we can, uh, by promoting uh, upstream and the uh, segment, the uh, production segment, mm -hmm. it is possible to create a uh, lot of uh, job opportunities for the young people. And now, after the, the harvest, when you get uh, your production, you get your milk, you get your fish, you get your uh, cereals, mm -hmm. the processing is another dimension of job creation. Yes. The marketing is another opportunity. The export is another opportunity. So what is uh, on the table today is how to support African government to promote uh, this, uh, uh, to develop these opportunities so that the young people that are being uh, currently attracted by uh, going outside can remain in the country, can create value addition in the country can create uh, wealth in their own countries. So, I mean, th this given, I mean, the, the old saying is that we have to keep reminding people it's the old, is, is Africa is a continent. Whereas some people, they tend to narrow it down to something a little bit smaller. But with the sheer range of geography, of farming, farming methods, techniques, and all that throughout the whole of the continent, this must be a tremendous struggle to try and come up with a strategy in, in an area of the world that seems to defy a, a one-size-fits-all strategy. Mm -hmm. what, what ideas are you coming up with to help with keeping people on the land, giving them a better future and giving industry a chance to 
could produce. So Africa is not just producing the raw materials, but is producing. Yeah, this is uh, 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 what we call the CADA framework, the new partnership yeah. with, for African development. And uh, this partnership has uh, set up a framework, the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program. Mm -hmm. In this program, you have a series of uh, activities yeah. and programs uh, that uh, have been thought uh, to assist African government in dealing with this different aspect. Of course, one size fits all uh, approach is not suitable in agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the agroecological uh, zone you are in, yeah. depending on the socio-economic context, you have to adapt the production. And what can be uh, uh, productive and uh, suitable in Northern Africa is no longer suitable in Central Africa or in Western Africa. And you are right. Africa is not a country, Africa is a continent, mm -hmm. a continent of 54, even 55 countries with uh, South Sudan. So I think uh, this approach uh, to have, uh, uh, how to uh, explain that, an approach that takes into account the specifics of each particular region, the specific of each particular production system is very important. And now what IFO is trying to do is to support, because in different regions, in different uh, uh, countries, Africans themselves, they s have set uh, for themselves objectives to be attained, to be reached. So what we can do is to support them from a technical point of view. You want uh, to get from, uh, to, from here to there, uh, maybe there are different ways to get there, but based on our experience in other places, in other regions in the world, we can advise you that maybe this, w this way is not, not, not necessarily the most straightforward, but this is the best way for you to go because you can get uh, more success uh, in doing so. I think this is uh, what uh, our partnership with African Union is mm -hmm. about. It is not about uh, telling them what to do, dictating what is good for them, what is not good, but it is about uh, listening to them, uh, supporting them in implementing what they want to implement for themselves. I mean, one of the, the advantages also is, is with improved governance, which some say is because the West and, and the old uh, Soviet Union are no longer uh, treating the continent as a political football. But with improved governance, it means that the farmers that you're talking about do have a way of feeding into the political system of having the voices work, of having a representative who can bring this. We've seen this with the Pan-African Parliamentary Summit that's going on ahead of a Heads of Leaders Summit. Are you seeing an improvement in governance? Are you seeing positive effects for the ordinary farmer who is the backbone of the continent? Yeah, I think this, this is a very important dimension. And Africans themselves, they call it inclusiveness. Uh, it is not only about uh, uh, technical programs. It is about finding the best way to sustain these programs. And if you want to sustain a program, you have to deal and to work with people. And this is what they call inclusiveness, meaning that everyone, every stakeholder should be around the table. The decisions should be made in a collective, in a corporate manner. It is not for one group of stakeholders to decide for the other group of stakeholders. The decisions uh, should be made based on a compromise between the different stakeholders. And this inclusiveness is very important from a governance point of view. And uh, maybe this is uh, also one of the major changes uh, we are noting in the African continent. Uh, you know, uh, FAO has uh, started this process at the FAO level. The Committee on Food Security, mm -hmm. uh, World Food Security, which is uh, hosted in Rome, not necessarily in the FAO, but uh, World Food Program, IFAD, and other UN organizations are part of that. 
the membership of EPO is part of the CFS. And we have there a mechanism by which all the stakeholders come together and decide, uh, even on the most controversial issues, what is the way to go, the way forward uh, for uh, uh, the, 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 the stakeholders uh, to go. Because I think uh, in Africa we say, when you decide something, even you want uh, the good uh, for someone, but if you don't associate him, he may ask himself, <laughs> 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 what is your motivation? Yeah. What is your yeah. incentive to do that? If it is about yeah. me, I think the uh, easiest thing is to consult with me so that I, I am part of the decision. I mean, this has taken a tremendous amount of time yeah. to come in. You're right. I remember many years ago I was working for a small NGO in rural Tanzania and I just said to the village secretary, what is this organization I'm employing like work? And he said, they're great. He said, what, what, why, what did they do that impressed you? He said, well, before they even started, they sent a group of people here and they asked us what we wanted. I said, yeah. And he just looked and said, well, no one's ever done that before. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, when did the first kind of Europeans come here to help? He said, oh, 1902. Mm -hmm. So they've had a very long wait before they're given the essential dignity of being asked what they want, surely. Now, as a diplomat yourself, you're, you're from Mali. Mm -hmm. You studied in Ukraine and you've been posted in Beijing. You must have a very, very good global view of the world and how Africa and African food problems fit in mm. to that. We're just seeing outside, you can't see this at home, but as we record in the studio outside, we've got the heads of states are beginning to appear in, and drive up outside. So I just wondered, you know, what would you say to the heads of states if, if they invited you to address them? What would be your message to, to the heads of state? Yeah, this is a, a big responsibility. Uh, if uh, you ask me to <coughs> say a few things uh, that could help uh, the African leadership in making decisions, uh, I would uh, humbly, very humbly, say that uh, presently uh, Africa is on the right track uh, as far as food security and agricultural development is concerned. We are on the right track. But what we need is the commitment from the leadership. Okay. The commitment also is not about uh, proclaiming what you want, what you wish mm -hmm. for the sector, for the farmers. The commitment should be translated into concrete measures, into concrete decisions if you want, into concrete financial and budgetary decisions. Look, in Maputo in 2003, our leaders decided that every country should allocate at least 10 percent of the uh, national budget mm -hmm. to the development of agricultural sector. Eleven years after, what we notice today is that only few countries have reached this goal of 10 percent allocation of uh, the national budget to the development mm -hmm. of the biggest sector in all our countries. Uh, I don't want to name any country in particular, but we know that uh, only eight to nine countries have reached this goal out of 54 countries. So then comes the question. Uh, our commitment should be translated into concrete decisions. And this is not a decision imposed by anyone from outside. This is a decision of our leaders themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to hold to keep this promise. And we are sure that if we are able to allocate these resources to the development of the agricultural sector. And this uh, allocation is not uh, dictated by anyone. It is a decision of the country, the decision of the government. But we want to ensure 
that there is enough resources allocated for the development of the agricultural sector. This is the only message I would like uh, very humbly uh, to reiterate uh, to our leadership so that uh, they can consider that. Uh, in all the countries where the allocation has reached 10%, and in this case I can really, uh, I have no problem to, to name uh, one or two countries. I can give the example of Ethiopia, I can give the example of uh, 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 Rwanda. Uh, these are countries that have allocated these resources. And uh, the result is obvious. If you go there, you see concretely what has changed in the life in the livelihoods of farmers. Because I think, you know, to say that, that farmers are uh, the, the bedrock of the continent is, is also pretty much the same for Europe. Yeah. It's kind of, we view things somehow differently and there's a little bit I've seen of a split between town and country. Yeah, well. but the difference with Europe is that in Europe you have only five to eight percent of farmers. Yeah. But in Africa, you have from 65 to 70 percent of the total population mm -hmm. are farmers. So to allocate 10 percent to this group is not too much. It, it's not the most outrageous demand I've ever heard raised in Brussels. <laughs> I, I think I can grant you that. Yeah. But I would like to say that, that your message actually does seem to have quite a lot of, of realistic hope in, in that we're doing roughly the right thing. Many of the African leaders are doing the right thing, they just need to do it a bit more. And Europe is learning that if we consult properly and listen to Africans, we can get better results than if we tell them what to do. Is that, is that a yeah, fair summation? The problem is that, that now I'm not sure that uh, African leaders would accept any kind of uh, ukaz or instruction to say this is what you should do, this is what is good for you. I don't think. I think time is uh, the time has changed. Yeah. Uh, now the Africans, I think, uh, they want really to be uh, the one to decide for themselves. And the best way to give a man or a woman a chance to define, decide life for himself is to give him an income, to give him a future yeah. as well. And this is why you're pushing. At agriculture and jobs because they're intertwined. If we can move beyond subsistence farming and move from providing the raw materials and get this production going, get this development going, get this marketing going because Africa is not what many people think it is. Many people have a view of Africa that's 20 years out of date. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of things have changed in our uh, current uh, world. You know, the people of my generation, when we wanted to make a decision or we wanted to decide about what to do in the future, even you, want, you should go to the university, of course, the advice of your father or the parents uh, was very important. But now our children, they don't ask. They just tell you, I have decided to do that. I have decided to do this way. And you have to agree with them. This is another time, you know. And exactly what happens in the families is exactly what is happening in the uh, uh, political arena. Uh, today, leaders, they have to listen to the people that have elected them. And they know what they want. And today, I can tell you that uh, agriculture, food security, is key in the success of African countries. You know, uh, somebody who cannot afford to buy the food he needs, he has no dignity, he has no right. The first right is uh, the right to food. If you cannot assure that your family, your children, your population gets access to the right amount of food, to the appropriate quality of food. So you lose credibility. And this is very important. And I, I am sure that our leaders, uh, we understand the constraints uh, they are facing, but we understand also that uh, they have committed to support this process uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that 
by 2025, all Africans, all citizens of this region get access to enough food, can recover their dignity. I think this is very important. Well, I think between Europe and Africa, there, there are tremendously deep and complex links a dark history and a light history as well. There's all sorts of things going on. But a feeling for Europeans would be to wish Africa well and to wish Africans well. And I think the best way that we can do it in Europe is number one, we do what you're doing. Hold our political leaders to their promises. Yeah. Make them accountable. Yeah. And also to remember ourselves that when we went around trying to tell people what they needed, we were wrong. We didn't make progress. So on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for all your work you're doing and thank you for calling in to see us. Thank you, Andy.